Welcome to Historical Spotlight. Since the income tax, tariffs have not been a major source of revenue for the United States government. For this reason, they seldom generated controversy in the United States. However, there was a time in America's history when tariffs generated enough controversy to almost incite a civil war. Today, we'll look at the third plank of Henry Clay's American system, protective tariffs. In the U.S. Senate in February 1832, Kentucky Senator Henry Clay gave a speech called In Defense of the American System. The United States Senate website lists this speech as one of the classic Senate speeches and notes that Henry Clay's American system remains one of the most historically significant examples of a government-sponsored program to harmonize and balance the nation's agriculture, commerce, and industry. In that speech, Clay defined the most important part of the American system. He stated, The policy we have been considering ought to be continued to be regarded as the genuine American system. The policy he was speaking of was the protective tariff. The tariff was so important to Clay's system that it became synonymous with it. In Clay's economic system, protective tariffs were key and served a dual purpose. They protected private industry from foreign competition and provided revenue for internal improvement projects. In turn, projects such as canal and road building produced needed jobs and improved the nation's infrastructure. A national bank provided cheap credit and a uniform currency. Clay believed this system would create a sound economy, and it was the responsibility of the government to promote it. The problem for Henry Clay was that the system had caused a considerable amount of controversy, and protective tariffs were the most controversial. Many of its detractors, such as Senators John Calhoun and John Randall, believed the policy unjust, unconstitutional, and economically unsound. In 1832, the policy was the catalyst for causing a constitutional crisis that could have led to civil war. Why would such a significant government program generate so much controversy and passion? To answer this question, let's take a deeper look at protective tariffs. Tariffs are defined as duties or taxes levied by the federal government on imported or exported goods. They have been in existence in the United States since the adoption of the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 states, The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Not everyone, however, was in agreement with how this article was to be interpreted. Henry Clay, foremost spokesman for tariffs in the U.S. Congress, gave an 1824 speech before the House of Representatives suggesting that there were two interpretations on the use of the tariff. He said, Two classes of politicians divide the people of the United States. According to the system of one, the produce of foreign industry should be subjected to no other imposts than such as may be necessary to provide a public revenue. This class of politician believed the tariff was simply a means to raise revenue for the nation to pay necessary debts and provide for the common defense. Clay then reveals the tariff interpretation of the second class of politicians. To the system of the other class, Whilst I agree that the impost should be mainly relied on as a fit and convenient source of public revenue, they would so adjust and arrange the duties on foreign fabrics as to afford a gradual but adequate protection to American industry. This second view on the use of the tariff believed it was not only a revenue-raising measure, but also a means to protect private industry, hence the name protective tariff. Henry Clay was in wholehearted agreement with this second interpretation, and it was key to his American system. In his 1832 speech, in defense of the American system, Clay attributed the previous seven years of American prosperity to the protective tariff. He stated, If the term of seven years were to be selected, of the greatest prosperity which this people have enjoyed since the establishment of their present constitution, it would be exactly that period of seven years which immediately followed the passage of the Tariff of 1824. In Clay's opinion, the protective tariff was responsible for the greatest economic success the country had enjoyed since its founding.
Protective tariffs were a mainstay of the mercantilistic economic systems of Europe since the 15th century. In the United States, shortly after the ratification of the new constitution, the first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, called for the use of the protective tariff as an official government policy. In his 1791 report on manufacturers, Hamilton argued that if the United States were to be prosperous and secure, it had to be economically independent from Europe. In order for a nation to be economically independent, it had to have a competitive manufacturing sector. Not only the wealth, but the independence and security of a country appear to be materially connected with the prosperity of manufacturers. There were, however, several factors preventing America from achieving this. First, since the United States was a new nation and primarily agricultural, its manufacturing sector was relatively immature. Second, European governments heavily subsidized their private industries. Third, Europe was allowed to dump cheap goods into the United States. Hamilton reasoned that if this situation were not remedied, the effects would be disastrous for America. The growth of home manufacturing would be retarded even further. Since Americans would naturally buy cheaper, more abundant, and possibly better made foreign goods, American manufacturers would lose markets and possibly fail. Second, America would remain dependent on Europe for its essential goods. In a time of war, this could be disastrous. Third, America's gold and silver bullion would leave the country, enriching foreign nations while America became poorer. To prevent these things from happening, Hamilton believed it necessary for the government to protect and aid domestic industry. This was to be accomplished by placing a tax or tariff on imported goods. This raised the price of foreign goods, making them more expensive than domestically produced items. People naturally bought the cheaper domestic items. In theory, this allowed domestic industries time to grow and become competitive with European manufacturing. This allowed the United States to become independent of Europe and a prosperous nation in its own right. Hamilton's economic theory was not without criticism, however. In Great Britain, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations wrote extensively on the problems associated with the mercantilistic system. In the United States, however, strong opposition to mercantilism was just starting to coalesce. In spite of some early criticisms, a move toward moderate protective tariffs became the economic policy of the nation until 1812. The average tariff rate from 1792 to 1810 was about 11%. This was in keeping with proposals made by Hamilton in his report. During the War of 1812, there was no real demand for a protective tariff. Foreign trade was blocked during the conflict, thus decreasing the importation of manufactured goods. As a result, domestic manufacturing expanded due to a virtually exclusive home market. Following the war, foreign competition increased and there was a call for a new protective tariff. In 1816, a new tariff was passed. It raised average rates to about 20%. Tariff historian Frank Tausig suggests two reasons for this new tariff. These and some other distinctly protective provisions were defended, mainly on the ground of the need of making provision for the exigencies of another war. The general increase of duties under the Act of 1816 was due to the necessity of providing for the payment of the interest on the heavy debt contracted during the war. During the war, it became obvious to the country's leaders that it was dangerous to be dependent on other countries for goods necessary for self-defense. The tariff was a way to spur the production of these goods in the event of another war with Britain. Also, the tariff would provide needed revenue to pay off the national debt incurred because of the war. Economist Murray Rothbard, however, notes that there was a third reason for the tariff that included protectionist aspects. He writes, the textile industry, in particular, was hit by the impact of foreign and especially British competition in the post-war period. Many protectionists charged that there was a British conspiracy afoot to dump their goods in the United States and crush infant American competitors. Thus, the higher rates were conceived as a temporary measure to ease the adjustment of domestic manufacturers to the new competitive conditions.
Thus, the Tariff of 1816 combined the elements of producing revenue for the federal government and protection for domestic industries against the threat of foreign economic domination. There was some opposition to the tariff from the commercial and agricultural sectors. Maritime centers in New England and the Mid-Atlantic regions felt a tariff might provoke retaliatory economic measures by Europe, thus hurting their trade. A comprehensive response against the protective tariff began to develop in the agricultural sector, especially in the South. John Randolph, U.S. Senator and Congressman from Virginia, in an 1816 speech, began to identify severe flaws with the tariff that would later become central arguments in the anti-protectionist camp. He stated, It eventuates in this, whether you as a planter will consent to be taxed in order to hire another man to go to work in a shoemaker's shop or to set up a spinning jenny. Here Randolph identifies the tariff as a hidden tax. A tariff causes a rise in the price of the imported goods. The cost of the domestic good could now be priced under the foreign goods. People naturally bought the cheaper goods, but at a higher price than they could have bought the imported goods. In effect, this caused a net gain to the manufacturer, but a net loss to the consumer. Since the agricultural regions were net consumers of these goods, they believed tariffs acted as an unfair tax. Randolph continues, I am convinced that it would be impolitic as well as unjust to aggravate the burdens of the people for the purpose of favoring the manufacturers, for this government created and gave power to Congress to regulate commerce and equalize duties on the whole of the United States, and not to lay a duty but with a steady eye to revenue. Randolph here identifies another problem with the tariff. As a tax, it was unfair because it favored the manufacturing sector of the economy over others. The United States Constitution clearly stated that taxes had to be uniform throughout the U.S. Randolph continues, No, I will buy where I can get manufacturers cheapest. Why pay a man much more than the value for it to work up our own cotton into clothing when, by selling my raw material, I can get my clothing much better and cheaper from DACA? Randolph may also be referring to themes found in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, that of a division of labor and comparative advantage. It may be that for some reason, people or countries develop a specialized ability to produce a good cheaper than others. This allows the individual or country to gain an advantage over others in producing that good, but it also gives an advantage to the purchaser by offering it at a lower price. Since a purchasing nation could only produce the good at a higher cost, or not at all, it makes sense to purchase the good from that nation. For those who believe in free trade theory, international trade in this manner makes everyone more prosperous. Wealth is not created by the accumulation of bullion as suggested by mercantilism, but by an exchange of goods between countries. Though Randolph's arguments were cogent, they did not persuade a sufficient majority in the South to defeat the bill. The tariff was eventually passed. It seems many in the South accepted the tariff bill as a necessary measure to aid the country if a new conflict with England arose. Also, the South was enjoying a time of economic prosperity, so the tariff was no real concern. Additionally, the tariff was considered mild and was to be lowered in three years' time. Congressman John Calhoun, later a senator from South Carolina and future fervent anti-protectionist, voted for the tariff. In 1819, an economic panic occurred and the country entered its first severe depression. As a result, the calls for a new protectionist tariff began. Economist Murray Rothbard identifies Philadelphia publisher Matthew Carey as the unquestioned leader in the movement. Carey's theory was that depression was caused by free trade. He reasoned that large imports of cheap foreign goods drained the country of specie. This caused a decay of national industry, which resulted in a depression. The remedy they offered was increased tariff protection for manufacturing, similar to that which was employed in the European countries. This would increase the cost of imported goods, causing people to buy domestic. And this would keep specie or bullion within the United States. Many cities and communities throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, Ohio and Kentucky, agreed with the protectionists and urged their congressmen and senators to push for a new tariff bill with higher duties on imported goods. In 
Interestingly, in spite of the economic downturn, it was generally agreed that the government was not in need of new revenue. Thus, a new tariff was not needed to raise government revenue. It also seems that the initial argument that protectionism was necessary to aid infant industries was also no longer valid. Frank Tausig notes that by 1820, cotton, wool, and iron manufacturers were no longer infant industries and were well on their way to becoming self-sustaining. On cotton manufacturing, he said, Under such circumstances, the industry was certain to be maintained. The duties of the tariff of 1816, therefore, can hardly be said to have been necessary. On woolen manufacturing, he said, by 1815, the work of establishing the manufacture had been done. The duty on iron may have actually impeded industrial growth. On iron manufacturing, he noted, we may therefore conclude that the duties on iron during the generation after 1815 formed a heavy tax on consumers, that they impeded, so far as they went, the industrial development of the country, and that no compensatory benefits were obtained to offset these disadvantages. It seems by 1819 most of America's vital manufacturers were well established. Also, there was no need for additional federal revenue. The need for a protective tariff was now seen as a way to cure the country's economic ills, supposedly caused by the importation of cheap goods. By 1820, several arguments against new protective tariffs were offered. First, the House of Representatives Agricultural Committee made the observation that the Depression was also severe in Europe, even though they heavily protected their industries. Therefore, a protective tariff in the United States would offer no cure. Second, Philadelphia economist, merchant, and state senator Condi Rage argued that if the protectionists were right, the manufacturing towns should have been the hardest hit by the Depression, whereas hard times were universal throughout the nation. Third, Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story, in a petition he wrote for the merchants of Salem, Massachusetts, accused the protectionists of destroying the capital and profits of commerce. Tariffs, they declared, would worsen the Depression by increasing unemployment and commerce. Fourth, many critics also pointed out that agricultural exports would be damaged because lower imports would supply less dollars abroad with which to buy American products. Economist Murray Rothbard notes that John Taylor of Caroline, U.S. Senator from Virginia, put forth one of the most sophisticated theories explaining how tariffs would further aggravate the Depression. Taylor reasoned that tariffs acted to diminish consumption, which increased the burden of the Depression. First, he argued that tariffs acted as a tax. During a Depression, a tax increased the burden on the consumer. The effect was to cause the consumer to limit their consumption of goods, thus hurting industry and weakening the economy. Taylor also argued that tariffs caused diminished imports, which brought about a restriction of exports. This decreased commodity values. Since the Depression had already lowered them considerably, this again placed a real burden on the people. This caused a further cutback in consumption. Taylor stated, the enjoyments of consumption are the food of industry. Diminish them, and it flags. Leave them free, and it is invigorated. Rothbard sums up Taylor's theory this way. Taylor regarded tariffs as a burden because he saw them as taxes on consumption. A tariff was a tax, which diminishes consumption, hence diminishes production and prosperity. He went on. Taylor also pursued this reasoning to advocate reducing tariffs in order to reduce the real tax burden on consumption, a surprisingly modern position. Taylor and many others attributed the Panic of 1819 and the subsequent Depression to the inflationary credit climate created by the Second Bank of the United States. If so, then a protective tariff would not help the economy, but in fact make it worse. This economic fact would not become obvious until 1930, when the Smoot-Hawley Tariff worsened the Great Depression. In 1820, another tariff bill was presented to Congress. It included higher duties on a long list of new items. These duties were to become permanent. The bill passed in the House of Representatives. A majority of the South, however, voted against it. The bill was narrowly defeated in the Senate by two votes. Historian Norris W. Prayer summarized the shift in Southern opinion this way. 
By 1820, the South realized that the earlier arguments and appeals of protectionism were no longer valid. None of these factors now existed to influence them. Now, with no other views to challenge or obscure this desire, the South turned almost unanimously against the Tariff Bill of 1820. The brief Southern experiment in supporting protection had come to an end, and from then on, that section would consistently oppose all protective tariffs. But Henry Clay was a hard man to keep down. In 1824, he will sponsor another protective tariff bill. This one will pass Congress and further inflame passions of those opposed to the policy.